So I want to start out by, by telling you a little story of, of my family. And I remember it so clearly uh, the first time I held our twins. Such a great memory. And, you know, for me, the whole pregnancy thing was kind of surreal. You know, I knew that Sue was pregnant, obviously. And I knew that the kids were alive. And I felt them, you know, kick on her belly and um, move around a lot. But they just weren't quite, quite real until I held them. And the nurses, I, I, we got out, out of the delivery, and the nurses asked me if I wanted to carry the kids to the room where Sue was waiting for them. And I was like, yes, but I was so scared. You know, they're so tiny. I'm going to break them. I was so nervous. And they showed me how to hold them. You know, I nestled one in one arm and the other in the other arm. And I, I walked down the hallway, and I was so slow because I didn't want to drop them. And they, they asked me their names, and, of course, I choked up. And finally, when I could speak again, I said, Caitlin and Connor. And, and I would just go from one to the next and one to the next. And, and when I handed them to Sue, when I got to the room and I handed them to Sue, I remembered the words of my dad. I remember he said, when you start a family, nothing will ever be the same. And, boy, is that true. <laughs> And, I, and I, that's the story of how my family started. And I'd like to remind you the story of how God's family started. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He made the sun and stars and trees and oceans and whales and robins. It's a good time of year for robins. And the pinnacle of his creation, the cherry on top of the, of the creation Sunday, was us, was mankind. And God had one main purpose in this creation of mankind, the creation of us, and that was, what, was that we be his family, that we partake in his life and that we dwell in, in, with him and we rule and reign with him. And part of me wonders that when that first heartbeat of a human echoed across the universe, if God didn't say, I have a human family now, and nothing will ever be the same. And boy, did we change things. You know, we chose ourselves over him. We chose to pursue selfishness over our heavenly dad. And we fell hard. And when we fell, the entire universe fell with us. From the largest sun to the smallest microbe, everything that was the masterpiece called creation was vandalized by sin. And... What was meant to be intimacy turned into separation because there's no way that sin can be intimate with a holy and perfect God. So we were separated from our dad. And there we were on the outside of the garden wondering, what do we do next? We can't go back. And there was God desperate to reunite with us, desperate to have his family together. And thankfully, he's had a plan. From the beginning, he's always known what we're going to do, not only to fix the problem of sin, but to reunite his family to him. <clears throat> I really need a box right here. <laughs> um, when Pastor Mike asked, asked me to teach, I, I wrestled with this. I didn't want to teach this. I wanted to teach this, but I didn't want to teach this. I wanted to teach it because the Lord has been calling me to teach this for years. And I didn't know how he was going to get me to teach it or when or what passage even. I just knew that this, this, this had to happen and for me as much as you. So always remember that when, I, when we teach, I mean, we teach to ourselves just as much as we do to you guys. And so this week I have been preparing in much fear and trembling for this message and of a little bit of tears every now and then. <laughs> so bear with me if things get a little intense. Um, if you'd like to stand with me, if you're able, we'll be reading in Hebrews chapter 2. And, and Hebrews is a book all about why Jesus is better. And in this section, it's, it's about why Jesus is better than angels. And one of the reasons why Jesus is better than angels is because of God's plan to reunite his family. And that's what we're going to talk about. So starting in verse 5. For he, that's God, for God has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels, 
But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Verse 10, for it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly I will sing praise to you, and again I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. You may be seated. So that, that first section is quoting Psalm 8, where it says, But one testified in a certain place, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? And that's talking about us. That's talking about mankind. And, you know, in my sober moments, in my thoughtful moments, in my humble moments, I ask that. Who am I? You know, who am I that you would even notice me? In this, the great ocean of humanity, I mean, we're not even a drop in the bucket. And yet he gives each one of us the ability to, um, to make choices, to make our lives better or worse. He gives each one of us the ability to appreciate a song, a horse running across the field, the sound of a waterfall, the beautiful sunsets he paints for us in Emmett, Idaho. We have this ability um, because we have a God who is mindful of us, and he knows each one of us. And we're going to see how intimately he knows you as we continue on through the rest of our passage. In verse 7, it says, You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. Now the, the him in this verse is talking about mankind. is talking about us. And we do see this. We, I mean, we have, we have tamed every um, animal on the planet. I mean, we've tamed whales. You know, we've captured every animal or tamed every animal. We've, um, we've crossbred plants and animals to get the kinds that we want. We have captured the airwaves to be able to communicate whatever we want to capture. We have invented medicines that have destroyed all kinds of harmful pathogens. And we have put creation under our feet. We have subjected creation to us. But at the same time, we haven't. At the same time, we know that even a tame animal can turn against us. You know, at, at the same time, we know there's illnesses out there we haven't even begun to figure out how to heal. We know that there's technology out there that is too powerful for us to contain. We know that, that our role in creation isn't done yet. We instinctively know that there's something about creation in us that's supposed to be partnership. It's not supposed to be control. And I, 
as crazy as they can get, that's why environmentalist groups, whether they know it or not, that's why environmentalist groups and animal rights groups exist, is because we instinctively know that there's something missing in creation and our relationship with creation. And, and we're going to see God's outline for fixing that as we continue in verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. And we can't miss the importance of this part. Jesus chose to become a little lower than the angels so that he could take part in that promise to us from Psalm 8. He chose to become like us so that he could be fully a uh, man. God had to know intimately just how deeply his creation had been wounded by sin. He had to. And that is why Jesus came so that he could know what it's like to be us so that he could reunite us, reunite us with God and his family. In verse 10, For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, that some of your translations will say author of salvation, or... Um, founder, and those are all good because captain, founder, author, those are all true. Jesus is the only one that drives this boat of salvation. He's the only one that has salvation figured out. And when it says perfect there, it's not talking about learning how to be sinless. Jesus was never with sin. He was always without sin. It was talking about perfect in our, his relationship with us. He couldn't complete his relationship with us until he became one of us. And did you catch that word at the beginning of that verse? It was fitting. In other words, somehow, it was proper. For the creator and sustainer of the universe, the being that's holding you together right now, somehow it was proper for him to know us at every level doesn't seem very proper. But in his eyes, it was fitting that he be born in pain and blood. It was appropriate that he faces the losses and the griefs that we face. It was proper for God himself to have family let him down, to have friends stab him in the back, to feel utterly and completely alone. It was fitting for the being who said, live, to the entire universe and to you and me, it was fitting for him to die in pain and blood. And I ask myself, how is that fitting? You know, how is that okay? That the only person to walk this earth in 100% love, 100% unselfishness, 100% trust, how is that fitting? It's crazy. It's anything but fitting. What's fitting is that I die. What's fitting is that I be tortured. What's fitting is that I pay the price for my sin. And I have this conversation with the Lord far more often than I care to admit to you. And he always replies, I love you. I love you, and I will do anything to have you in my family. but didn't you see what I just did? Didn't you see me willfully disobey? But I love you. I, I chose my way over your way. I, 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 I chose to sin simply because I wanted to. I will do anything to have you in my family. Oh, Lord, God, I'm not worthy. Even in, my, even in my unworthiness, I'm proud. 
You know, there's some weird, dark part of me that always takes you for granted. And he whispers so cool, so gently, I love you because of who I am, not because of who you are or who you aren't. I will always fail you. Don't you see that? I would do anything to have you in my family. And that's where we stand. We stand at the foot of the cross with the author of our salvation being the only answer. There's nothing you and I can do to add to his love. How dare we try? How dare we try? His love is it. And his love was freely given. Jesus chose, wasn't our choice, Jesus chose to open up the door for us to be in God's family. Turn with me, if you would, please, to Matthew 26. We'll be starting in verse 52. Matthew 26. And this is where Jesus is getting arrested, and Peter pulls out his sword, and he chops off the high priest's servant, Malchus's ear. And, and this is Jesus when he responds to Peter in verse 52. He says, said to Peter, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. And this verse 53 is what I want to focus on. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? So it looks to me like Jesus had a choice. It looks like he had opportunity and was potentially tempted to call 12 legions of angels. Now, a legion at this time was about five to 6,000 people. So we'll say 5,000. So that's 60,000 angels to rescue him. One angel in Isaiah, one angel in one night, took care of 185,000 soldiers. So that's 90% of Boise in one night. One angel. So 60,000, using the same equation, 60,000 could take care of 11 billion, 100 million. That's more than the whole earth right, populated right now. So I'm pretty sure they could have handled the guards in Jerusalem, the Romans and the Jewish guards in Jerusalem. I'm pretty sure they could have handled that. And I'm pretty sure Jesus had choice. It looks like he could have chosen to be rescued. And instead he chose to rescue us. He chose love. And you, we have to understand this. He chose to die so that God's relationship with us would be complete. He chose to know what it was like to fully be us. He had to die to know what it was like to be fully human. Because we're all going to die. Unless he comes back, which would be awesome, right? Come back, Lord Jesus, right now is good. I got time. But through Jesus and his resurrection, we will all live as his family forever. If you keep reading uh, in verse 11, we'll see, oh, I've got to turn back to Hebrews. Back to Hebrews chapter 2. In verse 11, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. And I don't know if this is accurate or not, but when I was studying this, something really jumped out at me. And, and this almost looks like a picture of Jesus' overall mission with us. It, it, uh, it, when he came, and it says, I will declare your name to my brethren. That's Jesus saying to God the Father, I'm going to declare your name to my brethren. And he did that. He came to earth and he declared the name of God to all of us and his brethren, specifically the Jews. And then, and, and again, it almost feels like, and next to me, 
I could be wrong. But, and next, I will put my trust in you. And Jesus did that. He trusted God the Father to, to, to die. He trusted him to be resurrected. He trusted him that he's going to live forever. And then the last section, it's almost like, here am I and the children whom God has given me. It's almost like Jesus saying, when I come back, I'm not going to be alone this time. I'm going to be with my family who are going to live with me forever. And that's us. And, and Jesus sanctifies us. It means to make us holy and pure. And he does all that work. And we become one with him. And we will live and reign with him forever. Forever! Yeah! And we continue to see this amazing connection that God chose to make for us as we, we continue in Hebrews. Uh, verse 14. Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death, He might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And through our fall, through the fall of humanity, Lucifer stole dominion over us and over this world. And we who were designed to rule and reign with Almighty God as his family, we find ourselves trapped. And it is a trap. This place is a trap. It's amazing, isn't it? Because you and I know, I I can sit down in a conversation with every one of you, and I can say, you know this place is temporary, right? And every one of you is going to say, yeah, I get that. But at the same time, in the next breath, I could be making a choice that is focused on this temporary place. We are trapped here. We're trapped in this place of loss and pain. We're trapped in this place of decay. We're trapped in this place of selfishness and jealousy. And eventually... We get to the point that we realize that we can't even blame Adam and Eve for the mess that we're in because we've all added to our own mess. We've all contributed to the problem of sin. And we've all fallen short of the glory that God had designed for us. You know, man, I wasn't going to say this. I really messed up this week. I mean, big time. Had a call, cold call. And I hope he's watching. I hope he's watching right now. This guy called, called up the church and said, hey, I, uh, my dad's dying. He doesn't know Jesus. I want somebody to go talk to him. My first reaction was, man, I'm too busy for this. And of course, you know, the Lord worked on that, obviously, and get things figured out with this guy where he's at and, and his, um, his girlfriend and get down there and I say, hey, I'm here. And she, she says, well, I'm, Oh, I forgot the important part. On the way there, I'm like, Lord, what is wrong with me? Why is my heart not dying in pain for this person? Give me a heart for the lost. Boy, did he. I got there, and she said, I'm taking a nap right now. Can I call you later? And I said, yeah, that'd be great. Call or text. And she never did. And I called back, and she wouldn't answer. So I lost out on a chance to share the gospel with somebody. And hoping, hoping you're on there and you call me, because I'll be right down there. Man, what a mistake. The Lord is good. He, he redeems those situations. Um, I had an opportunity yesterday to go pray with some people that are facing some really ser- serious end-of-life health situations and go hang out with them. And one of them was so cool. This is totally not in my notes. Okay, we're going to go over. Um, one of them was so cool. It was this couple that only came here a few times, but for whatever reason, they called me up weeks ago and asked for me to come pray with them. So I did, and the Lord has not let them leave my mind. It's like, you should go back. And I forgot their names. So I'm like, well, I can't go in there. I don't even know their names. Okay, Lord, if you want me to go in there, show me that his vehicle's there, and, and then help me remember their names. So I get there, no vehicle. 
And the Lord's like, park anyway. <laughs> okay, so I park, and I go inside, and obviously lost, right? Go down one hallway, I'm like, oh, no, this isn't it. I'd recognize her name if I saw it. And, of course, one of the attendants there said, you need some help? I was like, yeah. And I kind of explained the situation to her. And I said, I have this name in my head. And I said the name, and totally not even close. Not even close. But this gal said, can you describe them a little bit? So I described them a little bit. And she said, oh, that's. And, and she told me their names. And she said, I'm not supposed to tell you that. <laughs> and I thought, well, isn't that interesting? So she takes me back there and visit with them for a little bit. And then I got to tell her on the way out. I'm like, Lord, let her be at her desk. Let her be at her desk. And she was there on the way out. I got to tell her that she was an answer to prayer. And she just looked at me like, you are insane. <laughs> this is true. I am insane for Jesus. But it's just a reminder, you know, those situations I share with you, it's just a reminder that, that death owns us. It affects us, whether it's affecting us or affecting somebody that we know and care about. The only way free from the trap of death is to change the ownership that the enemy legally has over us via death, is to change that ownership to Jesus Christ. And he's the only one that can free us from the grip of death. He's, he wrests the power of death from the enemy, and he claims us. He claims you. Now, I picture, you know, the old explorer pictures of the guy finding the new world and putting the flag in the ground. And I claim this na land in the name of Jesus. That's what he's done for each of us. He's claimed you. And don't settle for anything less. Don't settle for the dressed up death that this world offers us. You know, don't settle for sex. Don't settle for relationships, don't settle for mind-altering substances. Don't settle for your ma letting your mouth ruin somebody else's day. Don't settle for entertainment. Don't settle for anything less than love. And you guys that know me know when I say love, I'm not talking about Disney love because that stuff that doesn't last. When I'm talking about love, I'm talking about agape love, the love of Jesus. The love where we set ourselves aside for other people. Don't settle for anything less than that. Now, if you want to know about love, read about Jesus. Study Jesus. Pray to Jesus. And you will find out so much love. It's overwhelming. Read the Gospels. Read the Gospels. Still cry every time I read them. Imagine that. And some of you may be tempted to say, um, well, the whole Jesus thing seems kind of distant to me. I know what I can experience here, or I know what I want to experience here. How is that a fair trade? Don't fall for that lie. That lie will kill you because this world's pleasures only lead in death. That's the only place they end up every time. You will die. And... However, in Jesus Christ, pleasures become a freedom. In Jesus Christ, we have the ability to experience pleasure as it's meant to be experienced. God is the author of pleasure. He invented pleasure. You know, God wasn't on accident going, man, you know, I'm going to make this really cool sunset and see if they happen to like it. Right? You know, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to let this person really enjoy reading books. I mean, it's not like it's an accident that we have pleasure in the world, right? So, but however, we can easily turn those pleasures into death. Uh, I'll use myself for an example. Man, this is so embarrassing. I like video games, okay? I know I'm not supposed to, but I do. And back when, when I was a, a young guy, you know, I would come home from work, and I would play video games every day till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I mean, every day. And now... I could still do that. If, guys, if I didn't have Jesus, I would, you don't even want to know what I would be. <laughs> I mean, I'd have my gamer tag all over the world, and I'd, yeah, yeah, no. Um, I would be probably divorced, because I don't think any woman could handle that. But um, it would be horrible. 
But with Jesus, that little pleasure for me is freedom. I can say, well, I'm going to entertain myself with that for an hour, and then I'm going to go to bed or whatever. So, so that's a really simple example of how freedom in Christ works with pleasures. And um, as his children, he wants us to experience the good things in life. You know, Pastor Mike and I, we often get concerned about Christian asceticism, this idea that if you put on a brown robe and eat gruel and pray on your knees till you have calluses on your knees, that somehow that makes you holy. No way. No way. That doesn't make you holy. Jesus makes you holy. And if he calls you to do that, then that's cool. But if you're doing it, then that's a problem. Let's continue on. In verse 16. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. And in Galatians chapter 3, one of my life verses, says this, starting in verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, Abraham's seed, and heirs according to promise. So in other words, we get help. Yes. And we're going to see how much more help as we continue on. And I just want to ask you right now, are you starting to get this picture yet about God's family? I've kind of been all over the place, so let's refocus on God's family. He has been thinking of you, and I could say your names. Most of you, I can say your names. He has been thinking of you since the beginning of time. And I know the scriptures never teach this, but the dad side of me believes this. I think he held you, each one of you, in his arms. And he said, nothing will ever be the same. You are an important and vital part of God's family. Don't waste it. Don't waste it in bitterness. Don't waste it in thinking that you're less than. Don't waste it in thinking that you're unimportant or unvaluable. You are invaluable. You have worth that cannot be counted. Don't waste it in social media. Don't waste it in anxiety. Don't waste any more of your time not pursuing God's goals for you. Um, one of the hardest lessons I've had to learn is to, to walk with God. To walk with God. That's really one of the hardest lessons I've ever had to learn. I, I mean, I, I got saved. I was like, okay, I've wasted a lot of time. I've got to get this stuff going. Did a, worked really hard. Had a vision for ministry. Did it all my way. Had a vision for serving people. Did it all my way. And what that resulted in was a sad, burned-out, middle-aged, bald man. (laughs) I mean, I was so mad at God. I mean, this was the plan, Lord. This was the plan. It was step-by-step. This was my three-year goal, my five-year goal, my seven-year goal, my ten-year goal. This was what we decided on. (laughs) And God, not not we. (laughs) And... That lesson for me, I mean, God has really disciplined me. And it, you know, I want to encourage you to avoid that discipline. It is extremely painful. And and just to to learn how to, okay, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to do what God puts in front of me today and walk in that. That is so hard. And, And I've been doing that for a while now. And now he's finally letting me, just a little bit, finally letting me plan ahead just a little bit. But I had to learn how to trust him in my day-to-day walk first. And I had to learn that, and this is still so hard, but I had to learn that when people let me down, it was okay. When I let people down, it was okay. That God had my back. He would fill in my blanks. That he has grace for, for both. And, um, and he taught me that no matter what I face, the fears or the losses I face, 
that he is with me and he's worthy of my trust and your trust. In verse 17, um, I'm just going to kind of go halfway. It says this. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. And I often tell my students, I often tell them, look, if God wouldn't have done this, then he would have, I would have stood before the judgment seat, and I would have said, you have no right to judge me, because you don't know what it's like to be me. You have no idea how hard it is to be human. But he does, because he did, in all things. Think about that for a second. Whatever you're facing right now, whatever doubt, whatever anger, whatever unforgiveness, whatever fears you're facing, in all things. Jesus knows what it's like to struggle with family. He knows what it's like to struggle with sickness. He knows what it's like to grieve. He knows what it's like to be exhausted and to be taken for granted, and to be ignored. He knows. He has faced all of that, just like we do, and he never sinned. He never made the selfish choice, not once. And he never looked down on anyone else. Let's go ahead and finish verse 17. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now, propitiation, that's the word I use all the time, right? I walk around town, I'd like some propitiation with that. No, that's not a word that we use that often. And it simply means a sacrifice to appease God or to turn away wrath. And when the original audience would have heard this word, they immediately would have thought of the Day of Atonement. And that very special day. So one day a year where the high priest was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies in the temple and make sacrifice for the people and make propitiation for the people. And on this, on this day, part of that sacrifice was they would take a, two goats, they would take one of them, and they would sacrifice it, and they would sprinkle its blood on the Ark of the Covenant, the big golden box, you know, with the angels on top. And they would sprinkle the, the goat's blood on the Ark of the Covenant to turn away the wrath of God from the sins of the people. And then the second goat, the, the priest would confess the sins and the rebellion and the disobedience of the people on that goat. And then they would take that goat out into the wilderness where it would never be seen again because it would be forgotten. And that's a picture of what Jesus does for us. It's a picture of he, his blood turns away God's wrath from us. His punishment takes the punishment for us. Every, every stroke of that whip that was meant for us turns away God's wrath. And the scapegoat was what they called the goat they saw in the wilderness. And the scapegoat is a picture of Jesus because it shows us that our sins and our rebellion and our disobedience are put on Jesus and they are forgotten. They are forgotten. As far as the east is from the west, right? Your sins are forgotten, past, present, and future. It, you know, it's not like when Jesus made that choice of... Um, I'm, well, I'm either going to have angels rescue me or I'm going to rescue mankind. It's not like that he made that choice and he chose to die and, and said, okay, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and do this, but there's, there's Billy Bob. Now, Billy Bob has 20,562 20, sins worth of grace. Then after that, Billy Bob's out of here. That's just not how Jesus works, right? It's not how it doesn't even make sense when you say it out loud, but isn't that how we live sometimes? And sometimes don't we look at Jesus and say, okay, no, whoa, that was, that was, that was out of control. That was, that was like, you can't forgive that one, right? I mean, that was like the five millionth time I've done that. And, and, and then there's Jesus going, what are you talking about? <laughs> you can't surprise me. It's not like he didn't know when he chose to rescue us, he knew we were going to be missy, Right? He knew we were going to struggle with sin. He knew we were going to face obstacles. He knew we were going to have a hard time um, dealing with this broken world that we find ourselves in. And he still chose to rescue us. So don't ever get caught in that trap of guilt and shame that the enemy tries to trick you in when you mess up. Guilt and shame is not from Jesus Christ. All the guilt and shame that you could ever own has been put on that cross and nailed to it. 
our, our walk is not one of guilt and shame. Jesus took all of our guilt and all of our shame. Let's finish out the, the chapter with verse 18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. You know, whatever you are facing, whatever darkness, whatever selfishness, fear, Jesus understands, and he's able to help. I think the question is, will you let him? You know, will you seek the help you need? Will I seek the help I need? Will we find ways to replace our fear with love? We tend to want to hold on to things like addictions. We tend to want to grasp pride. We tend to demand our rights. We tend, this one blows my mind, but I do it, and I know, I know that most of you do too. We tend to keep anxiety and fear and worry like it's, some, like it's valuable. It's like we hold on to that. Man, I, I can't wait to be worried today. That's, we, I don't understand why we do that, but we do. We tend to say, well, that's just the way I am. And that may be true. But the point of forgiveness is to change. The point of forgiveness is to allow the Holy Spirit to change us. Ooh. So this message has been on my, my mind and my heart for years, for you and for me. Um, and the reason why is I am I'm tired. I'm tired of wasting my time. I'm tired of seeing you waste your time. It's time for change. And I don't know um, about you, but I'm tired of wasting my life in entertainment instead of chasing God's dreams for me. I'm tired of, Mike's not supposed to be here for this part. I'm tired of demanding my time when there's people to love. I'm tired of choosing anger and anxiety over choosing to trust that God has my back. I'm tired of choosing the prison of sin over God's freedom. So the whole reason I am sharing this message with you is that it's time to change. And I don't know what change God is calling you to. You have no idea. Maybe he's calling you to give. Maybe he's calling you to give up. Maybe he's calling you to forgive. Maybe he's calling you to trust, even though life is awful scary right now. I don't know. I just ask that you say yes to him and that you make decisions on how to say yes to him because sometimes we need help, right? I mean, the scripture says bear each other's burdens. So I'll tell you mine. The Lord, this is so silly but I think most of, most of you will get this. The, the thing the Lord's been calling me to lately is that I, I stop demanding that my memory be the correct memory. <laughs> Sue likes that one? <laughs> At the end of the day, you know, who cares if there were 13 chickens or 15 chickens or whatever, whatever memory I'm disagreeing about, you know? <laughs> who, who cares? <laughs> So that, that's one that he's calling me to. And that's harder than you think because you get in a conversation with your spouse or actually your spouse is usually talking to someone else or your friend is usually talking to someone else and you have to interject and say, oh, no, 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 this is the way it was. So I'm trying not to do that. And, oh, man, I, I almost did the whole message just on this. I almost did the whole message just on this. You know, when Jesus went to that cross and he defeated death for us, what, what kind of life does that mean that we walk in? A life of, of defeat or a life of victory? A life of victory, right? And we forget that. You know, we, we get wrapped up in our whatever, and we forget that we're supposed to walk in victory every day. And, you know, and when Jesus defeated death on the cross, did he just defeat the big death? Did he just defeat the, the big one time in the life, heart stops death? Or did he defeat all the little steps of death in our lives too? 
He defeated all of it. He's going to redeem all of it. He's going to redeem everything in our lives. He's going to redeem our mistakes. He's going to redeem our hurts. He's going to redeem our losses. Everything he is going to buy back from the power of death for us. Every bit of it. And how cool would it be to walk in victory every day? You know, how cool would it be to wake up and, and listen? Really listen. And maybe, just maybe, Hear God whisper to you, you're in my family, and nothing will ever be the same. Great God, we love you, and um, man, I'm just in awe, I'm in constant awe of you, constant awe that you would call us, that you would love us, that somehow you use broken tools, and you still do amazing things. Lord, you're, you're incredible. And Lord, I ask you bless us as we learn how to be family together, and then and reunite with you as family, Lord, that that you bless us and you shield us from the work of the enemy because he hates us and he's going to do everything he can to trap us in death. Lord, and I ask that you protect us from that. And Lord, let us be defined by love. Let us be defined by forgiveness. Let us be defined by trust. Not so that we can be anything, Lord, but so that the name of our King and Savior, Jesus Christ, can be praised. And in that name we pray, amen.